We're in a study in this class entitled General Bible Introduction. Uh, what we are really talking about are three things. First, the inspiration of the Word of God. Secondly, the transmission of the Word of God. And thirdly, the translation of the Word of God. And right now we are beginning to make a transition from the transmission of God's Word to the translation of God's Word. What was a, or what is the translation that was used in the first century? Uh, that was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Yes, it was the Septuagint version. Uh, how else is it known? What, by, by what other names is it known by? Anybody remember? Yes, the LXX. When you uh, are reading various commentators, because it's easy to type that rather than Septuagint, because you have to remember how to spell it, uh, they just, it's easier to write LXX. But it still means the same thing. Uh, it means the same thing as the word Septuagint does. Is there another word by which it's known? Yeah, just the Greek Old Testament is the way some individuals refer to it. The Greek Old Testament. True or false? The Septuagint version was the only Greek version of the Hebrew Old Testament in the first century. Yes, that's false. There were several uh, Greek translations of the Hebrew Old Testament. Somehow, the uh, Septuagint just became the most popular uh, with Christians at that particular time. Um, true or false? The Septuagint version only contains the 39 books of the Bible that we have in the Old Testament. That's false. It contains a lot of more books than just our 39. Uh, in fact, we refer to those other books as the Apocrypha. And if we have time this morning, I'm going to get into the Apocrypha and introduce that uh, very quickly. Notice that little word, if... I have time, okay? Uh, we talked about the origin of the Septuagint version. We talked about how there were kind of two different trains of thought as to how that version came to be. Both um, ideas, however, have the Septuagint version originating in what city? Anybody remember? Yeah, the city of Alexandria in the uh, country of... Egypt. Okay, some believe that Ptolemy, who was the king at that time, was the one who authorized it. Others believe that it was just the sheer need of the Jews who were Greek speaking Jews in that city, not Hebrew speaking Jews, who needed a translation of the Hebrew into Greek so that they could continue to uh, practice and continue to uh, adhere to the Jewish faith. And uh, most individuals believe that the second one is probably the uh, more correct. Uh, reason why the Septuagint version came into existence. Um, we're entering into a section now entitled The Benefits of the Septuagint Version. Okay, the benefits of the Septuagint version. And there are a few benefits that the Septuagint has. Notice the first one, very practical, at least to the Jews of that day. The LXX made the Old Testament available to the Jews who spoke the Greek language in Alexandria. Okay, Guys, if you can't speak a language, is that a detriment? Yeah, that's a detriment. I, we have gone over to Costa Rica and Honduras and other places, and I have experienced worship services in Spanish with no translator. That did me no good. I just sat there like a knot on a log, okay, wondering, what is he saying, okay? Uh, and never did I say amen. <laughs> never. Uh, but uh, So here these Greek-speaking Jews were. They needed the uh, Old Testament in Hebrew, uh, translated for them into Greek, and now they could practice their religion much better. Notice the second one. It corresponds to that. The LXX made the Old Testament available to the entire Greek-speaking world, okay? Not only do the Jews have it, but now the entire world has it. Um, who was reigning in the days of Jesus? What nation? Rome. So why were they speaking Greek? 
If Rome was in charge, why were they speaking so much Greek throughout the Roman world? Now, we talked about that. Absolutely. Remember, Alexander the Great overthrew the Persian Empire and uh, he, he conquered the entire known world in his day. And one of the things that he did was to infiltrate the Greek language into uh, the entirety of the world. So uh, Greek was just the language of the people. What kind of Greek did we say? What kind? Koine Greek, yes, the everyday language of individuals. Notice this next one. I thought this was interesting. A benefit of the Septuagint version. The Septuagint version helps us to pronounce some of the words of the Old Testament. Now, somebody might say, what in the world are you talking about? Guys, if all we had was the Hebrew, okay, and we were trying to read the Hebrew, guess what the Hebrew doesn't have? It doesn't have vowels. Now, let me, is it very difficult to pronounce a word if you don't have vowels? It is for me, A-E-I-O-U, and sometimes, oh good, I'm glad y'all got that in school. Um, and sometimes why, but can you imagine trying to pronounce a word if you don't have any vowels? Y-W-H, what's that say? Y-W-H. I wouldn't have a clue. Wah ha wah. I mean, I, you see, you don't you don't have any way to pronounce it. And uh, so uh, the Hebrews they had learned how to pronounce their language from the very moment it was given to them, didn't they? So so they knew how to pronounce the language and they knew what the words were, but. Not everyone did. Now they take that language which has no vowels, translate it into a language which has vowels. Now, guess what? Now I know how to pronounce what? Those Old Testament words. Now, question. Who was it that made this translation, especially of the Pentateuch, uh, the first five books of Moses? Who was it that made this translation from Hebrew to Greek? Who, who were these men? Yes, 72 Jewish scholars. Okay, 72 Jews. So they knew the Hebrew extremely well, and when those men brought that over into the Greek language, they knew how to pronounce it, and so when they wrote those words with vowels, they used the vowels to help us be able to do what? Pronounce the words Yahweh, right? Jehovah. Okay, so there's tons of words that it helped us uh, to pronounce. Notice point D. The Septuagint paved the way for the New Testament's theological terms. Okay, now, let me try to explain what's going on in this particular section. All right? And I find it interesting because uh, God is making a... Tra when, when it comes to the New Testament, God is making a translation from Hebrews... To who? What's going to become the predominant group of people that accept the gospel? Greeks. Okay. Now, question. What was the background of the Greeks religiously? Poly. Yeah. Polytheism, paganism, idolatry, right? Now, here's what's interesting about that particular religion. They use many of the same terms that... Christian Jews. Okay? Guys, they speak about righteousness. They talk about mercy. They talk about law. They talk about propitiation. They talk about wrath. Okay? So, here you are, you've got all these Greeks over here that have grown up in paganism and they've heard all these words, all these theological terms, but they understand them in their relationship to what? Paganism. Okay? Paganism. Those same words were used in the Hebrew Bible. Righteousness, law, mercy. Okay? But guess what, guys? God used them in a totally different way than who did? Than the Greeks did. Okay? But now all of a sudden, guess what? We take that Hebrew language that doesn't use these words the same way. We translate it into the Greek language. Now we're making a transition from Hebrew into the Greek. 
when the Greeks start reading the set, or, yeah, when the Greeks start reading the Septuagint version, they're reading the definitions as they were found in the Hebrew Old Testament. You see what I'm saying? Okay, didn't have, so so now when you go now when Paul he leaves and he goes on his missionary journey to who? Who's he pr- predominantly go to? The Gentiles, right? Okay, uh, these individuals have read some of the what? Septuagint version. They, they've read the Old Testament Septuagint version. Now it's not as hard to get them to understand New Testament concepts because they've already learned some of that from what? From reading the Septuagint version. Does that make sense? That, that's what that point right there means. So I hope that I've illustrated that or explained that well enough. It's kind of a transition volume, okay, to help the Greeks understand theological terms, not as they grew up with them, but as God had revealed them in the Old Testament. Okay, so it, it puts a, a very interesting spin on the Septuagint. Notice the next one. And this is the one that I love and that I like to talk about more than any of them, okay? Um, The fact that we have the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament by what date? Anybody remember? When was it completed? Anybody remember? Around? Yes, 132 B.C. Now guys, get that. Okay. Here we've got the Septuagint version, which includes all 39 books of the Old Testament. We have it fully translated by 132 B.C. That's 132 years before Jesus is going to be born. That lets me know that all prophecy of the Old Testament was done, it was written, it was here, it wasn't going to be revealed at a later date. It was already here. Is that important when it comes to prophecy? Oh yes. You see... Individuals who are modernists, individuals who do not believe in the inspiration of the Word of God, okay, those individuals like to tell us that the prophecies found in the Bible were not written before the prophecy was fulfilled. They were written when? After the prophecy was fulfilled. Okay, so here's this individual who is looking back in the course of time, writing this book, and he makes it look as if it was what? Prophetic, but it wasn't really prophetic. The event had already been fulfilled. So see, they take away the inspiration of the Bible, don't they? Okay. Well, guess what they can't remove? Messianic prophecy. Every Messianic prophecy of the Old Testament was written, I know, at least 132 years before Jesus got here. None of it was written after His birth. Is that important? Oh yeah. You see, it shows how accurate the prophecy really is. Okay? And that, you know, how, how could a man write 132 years before something happens in the detail in which the Old Testament writes about? 330 plus prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. Right? Okay? Now, we're not talking about he's going to be a man, although the Bible said that he would be a son, right? He's going to be born of a virgin. He was going to be born in Bethlehem, right? He was going to be exiled to Egypt for a period of time, right? I mean, on and on and on. We could just, I mean, there's just hundreds of things we could talk about, and most of them are very minute, very detail-oriented, and now I have them written before Jesus comes, and now 132 years later, Jesus is born and starts fulfilling every one of them to the what? to the letter. Okay? You see, I know that the Old Testament is inspired of God. Okay? Because of what? Because of the Septuagint. It was translated 132 years before Jesus came. So, a very, very interesting uh, thing. Notice this next one. Uh, The Septuagint has been consulted by other translations. Okay? So, when individuals are going to uh, make a translation into another language, one of the sources that they consult is, guess who? The Septuagint version. Uh, Is that wise or unwise? Probably better to look at the original than the translation of the original. 
Okay? But who translated the Septuagint? 72 Jewish scholars who were scholars of the Hebrew language. So it's not really a bad thing, okay? Now, it's not to say that we need to make our full translation from the what? From the Septuagint. But it's wise to go and consult the Septuagint sometime to see how those Hebrew scholars made a translation. Okay, no, nothing wrong with that. You know, uh, what does the Bible say? That in a multitude of counselors, there's what? There's wisdom, isn't there? And so uh, it would be wise to do that. And uh, what's interesting is there's very few Bibles on the market today in English that have consulted the Septuagint. Very few. Okay? Because uh, for the most part, um, the uh, Protestant community, and I use that term, you know, very broad in general, uh, and I use it uh, in uh, distinction to Catholics. Okay? The Catholics still use what? The Apocrypha, which came from the Septuagint, okay? And one of the reasons they used the Apocrypha is because it was in the what? Septuagint, okay? And for the most part, Protestants, and, and you know, I'm just meaning not Catholic, um, they have rejected the Septuagint version, and therefore, when translations are made by those groups that are Protestant, they, they just refuse to do what? Look at the Septuagint version, okay? But there are a couple uh, that are in existence. Notice the Old Latin, the Slavonic, the Syriac, the Old Armenian, the Old Georgia, and the Coptic translations. Uh, all of those are in foreign languages even to us. They all consulted the uh, uh, Septuagint version. Uh, the New Jerusalem Bible and the NIV both consulted the Septuagint version, as they were making their um, translations. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, okay? I, th I think it's okay to make some looks and see, uh, but they're about the only two of the mo more modern versions that did use the uh, Septuagint. Any questions? Comments? See, that's called perfectly executed teaching when there's no questions, okay? Or you're just as confused as ever and you don't want to say another word. Maybe that's the one. Uh, notice point number six, okay? This is very interesting right here, guys. And uh, I am not a scholar on any of this. I, I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I'm not a Greek scholar. I'm not a Septuagint scholar. You know, I, I, just, I know a little bit of Bible, okay? Um, but one of the questions that is asked is, did Jesus and did the apostles and the inspired writers of the first century quote from the Septuagint version. Okay? That's interesting, isn't it? Now, remember, the Septuagint version was written in 132 B.C. So it was here when Jesus was around. What language did Jesus speak? He would speak Greek. Okay? He would speak Hebrew too, right? Uh, so, so, I mean, he knew about the Septuagint, wouldn't he? Okay, because it was one that was uh, used quite a bit. So um, it wasn't like it was hidden from him at all. And so the question that many have asked is, in our Bibles today, did they quote from the Septuagint version? And here's the answer. It all depends on who you ask. Okay? Now, to really know the answer to that question, you would have to be pretty well versed in... Greek and Hebrew, okay? I've given you two quotes, okay? Here's the first one. There are many who believe that the New Testament quotes from the Septuagint many times. Notice this quote. Of the places where the New Testament quotes the Old, the great majority is from the Septuagint version. Okay, now notice that. This individual says, almost every time you read about a quote from the Old Testament, it's from what version? From the Septuagint. Protestant authors, Ar Archer, and I can't hardly say that guy's name, lists 340 places where the New Testament cites the Septuagint, but only 33 places where it cites from the Masoretic text rather than the Septuagint. Wow. So if that's the only quote I found on the internet, what would I say? Oh, yes. Man, our Bibles just quote all the time from the Septuagint. Well, notice this others. There's some who do not believe that the New Testament quotes from the Septuagint at all. The claim that Jesus and the New Testament writers always use the Septuagint to quote from the Old Testament is without biblical evidence. How do you like that one? 
It is also, it has been said that in the New Testament there are about 263 direct quotations from the Old Testament. However, many of these Old Testament quotations in the New are significantly different from the Septuagint. If Jesus and the apostles relied on the Septuagint for all their Old Testament quotations, such a difference would not have resulted. Okay? So in other words, when you compare the Septuagint to the Greek uh, manuscript, Yes, there, there's some similarity, but there's also what? There's also difference. Okay? Now, those who want to think that uh, they did quote from the Septuagint, look at the similarities. Those who don't want to believe that Jesus and them quoted from the Septuagint, look at the differences. You see? So that's where, that's where this whole thing comes into play. Now, here's what this man goes on to say. And the reason I quote this is because I believe this part of what he says. There was no need for Jesus and the New Testament writers to rely on the Septuagint to quote the Old Testament. Jesus himself was the author. <laughs> he was the author of the Holy Scriptures. He could quote Hebrew Scriptures and translate them infallibly into Greek. Isn't that true? As far as the apostles were concerned, the Holy Spirit was their chief aid who supervised their writing of the Scriptures. There was nothing against them citing Old Testament and translating the words into Greek themselves. Let us be mindful that both Testaments were inspired of the Holy Spirit and that the Spirit was the infallible author. Now that's what I like. Okay? I believe that. All right? Yes, sir. <laughs> and when he said, have you not read, obviously, whoever he's talking to read something. Right. <laughs> what was that something? Talking to Jews and, and being Jewish leaders, it would not be the Septuagint. Okay? It would have been the Hebrew Old Testament. That's what was read in the synagogues. Okay, was the Hebrew Old Testament. And the Hebrew Old Testament was being uh, developed as far as a canon is concerned. It would be called the Masoretic Text, but it would not be fully canonized until 100 A.D. Okay, but most of the time if Jesus says, have you not read, he'd be talking about one of the, number one, he'd be talking about one of the Old Testament writers, right? One of those 39 books. And most of the time he'd be talking about the Hebrew Bible that those individuals would have at their disposal. Yep, not the Greek. Uh, if, if, when he asked that question. Uh, to a Jewish leader, okay, for certain. Uh, very interesting. Notice a few points and we'll conclude. Um, the Septuagint version did and still does exist. You can order you a copy today if you want to. Cost you about $65, $70. I was going to order one. I said, I ain't paying that. It's for something I can't even read. <laughs> Uh, the controversy as to whether Jesus and the other New Testament writers did or did not quote from the LXX will always exist. You know that? Okay. I just know that what? The New Testament is inspired of God. You know, that's what I'm glad about. The Septuagint included the Apocrypha. These are books that are not included in our Bible. These are the topic of the next discussion. Folks, if, now the Apocrypha is a little different. If you want to buy the Apocrypha, you can buy the Apocrypha. Okay, little bitty. Uh, mine even has, uh, it says this, Authorized King James Edition. Ain't that a hoot? Okay, you can buy it in ESV. You can buy it in all kinds of, uh, of the languages that you want it translated in. But here's the Apocrypha. I brought this Bible. This is the confraternity version of the Catholic Church. And guess what's in here? What's in here? Well, almost. Okay. They don't have all the Apocrypha in the confraternity version, the, the Catholic version, but they have many of the books. And so next week you come back and we will introduce to you the Apocrypha. And see, I got notes that I was going to give you. I told you if y'all were not so long-winded, we'd have gotten into it. But we'll get into it next week. So that'll do it. Go eat you something. Thank you.